No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual services in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to twice be put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be witness against himself, not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for the public use without just compensation. There's a lot in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, a lot more than most people realize. Hang on to your seats, folks, while we unpack the restraints of due process in the criminal courts. When our society discusses issues politely with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well... It's time for some Roasted Opinions. The Fifth Amendment provisions are quite powerful. Their roots are core principles of English common law sunk deep into the fertile soil of the Enlightenment. When we ponder the intricacies, <laughs> right, gotcha. First of all, a grand jury must be impaneled to hear the facts of a suspected felony before a trial can occur. Grand juries in America are groups of ordinary citizens who serve as a preliminary filter on felony court cases. The prosecutor lays out the charge and evidence, and if the majority of the grand jury finds that there is a reason to believe that the prosecutor has a case, then they vote out a true bill, also known as an indictment. The purpose of this is to test the evidence which the prosecutor has collected to see if a group of reasonable, ordinary people would be persuaded to think that the suspect committed a crime. Unlike petty juries, the 12 people who hear and decide a jury trial, no instructions are given and the grand jury has the ability to subpoena witnesses. A grand jury can even go beyond the scope of the case to investigate. In 1935, a grand jury was convened in New York to hear gambling cases against Dutch Schultz and his gang, which lodged complaints of prosecutorial misconduct, leading to the appointment of Thomas Dewey as a special prosecutor and significantly impacting the rate of conviction for offenses related to organized crime. Grand juries have quite a bit of power, but they are still just ordinary citizens. And in America, indictments come from grand juries. Elected officials and bureaucratic appointees cannot issue indictments on a political whim or for personal gain. There is a notable exception to the grand jury clause in the Fifth Amendment, the Military Law Clause. The framers recognized that the armed forces defending the nation and the militia when called to duty need a different code of laws to govern them. That code is now called the Uniform Code of Military Justice, or UCMJ. The UCMJ is completely separated from civilian law, and necessarily so. While civilian law is designed to keep the peace, military law is designed to promote good order and discipline. There are distinct differences in the list of potential violations and the penalties for those violations in military law. The military chain of command issues charges and specifications, not indictments and it is possible to be convicted of a lesser offense even if the specification is not found to be as severe as charged. Again, this is because of the difference in the purpose of the law, and any service member knows that many rights, privileges, and protections afforded them under civilian law simply do not and cannot exist in military justice. Freedom of speech, for example, is very liberal for civilians. Soldiers do not enjoy absolute freedom of speech and can be punished for speaking their mind. The Double Jeopardy Clause protects all citizens from being tried more than once for the same crime, except in specific circumstances. The government cannot appeal a criminal acquittal. It can only lodge separate trials for separate crimes, although if it can find evidence of another crime in the same act for which the defendant was already acquitted, it can bring charges for that crime separately. Double Jeopardy does not prevent two states from bringing separate charges for the same act against the defendant and it does not prevent a new trial after certain mistrials. Since the UCMJ is a separate legal code with a separate jurisdiction, it is possible for serving military personnel to be charged with both a civilian offense and a military offense for the same act, such as drunk driving. 
The most famous clause of the Fifth Amendment is the Self-Incrimination Clause. When the framers drafted the Bill of Rights, English common law still allowed coercion and torture to extract confessions. The protection from testifying against one's self eliminated these tactics from due process, and also eliminated both the oaths of innocence sworn before criminal proceedings, which opened every suspect to a charge of perjury if they swore this oath and were found guilty, and the compulsion to name accomplices and associates. Joseph McCarthy famously violated the provisions of this clause with the Army McCarthy hearings, which brought about the end of his career as a public servant after he ruined the reputations of hundreds of American citizens. In Miranda v. Arizona, another critical test of this clause was established. Ernesto Miranda was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and rape, and after a few hours of questioning signed a confession. His lawyers argued that the confession had to be excluded from the trial because Miranda was not aware that he had the right to remain silent and to consult with an attorney, and no one had advised him of these rights. The Supreme Court agreed, and this is why everyone who is arrested in America gets read their Miranda rights. Does that mean that a convicted rapist went free? Um, no. Just, no. Miranda's conviction was thrown out for lack of evidence when the confession was excluded. But the prosecution went right back to work because the Supreme Court's ruling did not create a case of double jeopardy. The confession was excluded after the conviction, but further investigation turned up sufficient evidence to convict Miranda of both charges. When asserting the right to remain silent, the interrogation must stop by law. If a suspect asks for a lawyer, the interrogation cannot resume until they obtain legal counsel. Even if they have no means to pay for a lawyer, they have access to one through the courts. In 2010, the Supreme Court ruled in Burgess v. Tompkins that these rights must be specifically invoked during interrogation. Several other decisions have established that the suspect must understand his or her rights in order to waive them, but that if the suspect speaks after invoking those rights, their statements are admissible. So, Americans do have the right to remain silent, but they must also have the capacity to remain silent. Based on the case law which I've read, so many Americans simply do not have that capacity. Every statement made after invoking the right to remain silent is admissible. It doesn't matter to whom this statement is made, with very few exceptions such as attorney-client privilege. Silence means silence, and very few people can truly remain silent forever. Many people cite the 14th Amendment for establishing due process of law, but due process was actually established by the 5th. This is simply a fancy way of saying that everyone gets the same rights and is bound by the same procedural rules in court cases. What the 14th did was... Well, let's save that for another video, shall we? Lastly, I've covered the fact that eminent domain was first established under the 3rd and 4th Amendments. But the 5th clearly defines that property seized for the common good requires a just payment. Property rights are very important in America, and this is due to the Enlightenment. At the time of the Enlightenment, depriving common people of property was actually a common practice. It was a remnant of the feudal system in which the whole of the country belonged to the king and was given as fiefs to the great nobles, who then gave it on fief to lesser nobles, who then entrusted it to the commoners. That's why, even though commoners could purchase buildings and land from each other, they still owed rents to the nobles, and why they could be deprived of that property if the noble decided to claim it without receiving compensation for it. This system actually still survives to some extent in the form of property taxes, even in America. Those who own property have a duty to pay for the infrastructure support provided by the government for the public good. But that would open a discussion on taxes, and that's a whole other video or two. Now the protections of the fifth are meant to work cooperatively with those of the fourth and the sixth amendments to protect ordinary citizens from a runaway government, charging them with crimes, forcing their confessions, seizing their property, and inflicting unjust punishments. I wonder if people might keep that in mind when they interact with one another. After all, the mob can ignore the rights of their fellow citizens just as swiftly as the government can. This is why publicly leveling accusations instead of taking these accusations to the police is so pathetic. It bypasses these protections which were in part designed to protect the reputations of the falsely accused, leaving them no recourse but to seek redress in the courts once they can demonstrate actual harm was done to them. If you have evidence that someone, anyone, has committed a crime, I urge you to report the crime to the police instead of starting another social justice movement. 
Hashtag MeToo has now been turned into a political weapon, folks, if you haven't caught the latest on the Kavanaugh confirmation process. If Kavanaugh committed a crime, then certainly the police should investigate it. Leveling an accusation decades after the fact, especially just in time for his confirmation vote, when the evidence was available well before the hearings, is reprehensible and creates the impression that those who raise accusations will never receive justice. How exactly does that help America? Every political weapon is turned on its wielders in time. Will we now see decades-old accusations of criminal and sexual misconduct in every election against every candidate? If so, how will we find anyone who isn't smeared to elect? And how will we filter out actual criminals through the vetting process? Now that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring the notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8pm Central Time. Join me on the last Saturday of every month when I invite guests to join me in the kitchen. New content is coming, so watch this space.